Kirin Neskol. We are very happy to have you with us today. First, I want to thank our partners for being here and all the cluster member of Tunis for being here. Also, uh, Carolina from Imperial College and Elisa, thanks for being here. Uh, so today is the kickoff of the project AMAX. And uh, the plan of the day is first we will start with a welcome word from our director. Of and then I will give a presentation to of, uh, of, of the project. And then we will have a lecture with uh, Professor Thambi. This is for the morning. And during the afternoon, we will have a meeting and a presentation from the different PI of this, uh, this project. Uh, so please, uh, Madame la Directrice. Merci d'être avec nous. Good morning. Bonjour tout le monde, merci Amira. Chers collègues, honorable invité, euh, je suis ravie et honorée de vous accueillir aujourd'hui ici à l'Institut Pasteur de Tunis pour le lancement du projet AMAX qui est axé sur la modélisation pour la santé publique. La santé publique est une préoccupation universelle et nos pays sont confrontés à des défis similaires. La modélisation pour la santé publique revêt une importance capitale dans notre époque où les défis sanitaires sont de plus en plus complexes et interconnectés. Que ce soit la gestion des épidémies, la planification des services de santé ou l'élaboration de politiques de prévention. La capacité à anticiper les tendances et à évaluer l'efficacité des interventions est essentielle pour guider nos actions et maximiser nos ressources. Dans ce contexte, la modélisation et l'analyse des données jouent un rôle crucial dans la prise de décisions éclairées et la formulation de politiques efficaces. La modélisation nous permet de comprendre les dynamiques complexes de la santé publique en nous aidant à prédire les tendances à évaluer l'impact des interventions et à concevoir des stratégies adaptées. Que ce soit pour anticiper la propagation d'une épidémie, évaluer l'efficacité d'un programme ou encore optimiser la location des ressources sanitaires, les modèles mathématiques et statistiques sont des outils précieux pour guider nos actions. Ce projet revêt une importance particulière car il nous offre l'opportunité d'échanger nos expériences, de partager nos meilleures pratiques et de renforcer notre collaboration régionale pour renforcer nos capacités individuelles et collectives à relever les défis de la santé publique dans nos pays respectifs. Je tiens à remercier chaleureusement tous les partenaires présents aujourd'hui pour leur engagement je félicite en particulier Dr Emir Akbayr ainsi que Dr Slimane Ben Milet et Dr Dora Luiti pour leur engagement et pour cet accomplissement. Je suis convaincue que grâce à votre implication, vous parviendrez à faire de ce consortium un moteur de progrès en santé pour nos pays. En tant que directrice de l'Institut Pasteur de Tunis, je m'engage à vous apporter tout le support requis pour l'aboutissement de vos objectifs. Merci. <laughs> so thank you very much for all of you to be here, and I'm uh, very happy to, to uh, that this uh, this is the first school that uh, the school and workshop that we organize on, uh, on AMAX. It's also the first second I say second uh, days of uh, of workshop on uh, public health, the relationship between modeling and public health. 
And I would like to, I'm very happy to have uh, this, uh, this uh, variety of uh, countries, variety of experience, variety of, uh, of peoples here. So uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and I hope that we can have uh, three days very important, very richness with a um, lot of ideas and a lot of, uh, of, do, of, uh, of working to do and work on work already done. So I will say it in French, perhaps it will be easier. Je voudrais tous vous remercier et vous souhaiter la bienvenue ici. C'est un, un événement majeur pour nous parce que ça marque le début d'une relation entre les, les décideurs politiques et les modélisateurs. Ça marque aussi un, 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 un travail qui va être fait, qui a été déjà fait et qui va être fait dans le futur sur la modélisation et les relations avec les, les décideurs de santé publique. Je remercie aussi euh, Madame la directrice de nous accueillir, de nous avoir donné toutes les, euh, toutes les capacités, toute la, toute le, tout, tout, comment le, euh, tout ce qui est nécessaire pour bien organiser cette manifestation. Donc, merci beaucoup Madame la directrice. Je souhaite aussi remercier tous les personnels de l'Institut Passeur qui nous ont aidés à, à, à faire que cette journée, euh, ces journées soient, soient, soient celles qu'elles seront, je l'espère. Je remercie aussi Ahlem Zarak qui était euh, un, élément fondament, un élément moteur chez nous car elle permet la relation entre euh, modélisateurs et, euh, et décideurs de santé publique. Just, uh, I will say, uh, say it in English because uh, the, the last part I, I didn't say it in English. So I would like to thank uh, the head uh, of, of Pasteur Institute who, who allow us to, to organize these things here. We, she, she also allows us to, to, to work in this environment, which is a very nice environment, very enriched and richness environment. And uh, I would also like to thank all the persons who allowed us to organize this event in a very good way. All the personnel of Pasteur Institute who allow us to, to organize this. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, Ahne Mizar. She's uh, one of the uh, most important person who allow us to make the relationship between uh, the, the person who takes the decision in the public health. And uh, we, who are uh, modeler, mathematicians, who have know anything about uh, how to take the decision, why the decision is taken, and she's uh, really playing uh, an important role in the, this relationship. So thank you very much, all of you, and, uh, and uh, welcome. <laughs> Uh, so let's start with a small presentation. It will not take more than 20 minutes, be sure, around the project AMAX, which is African Modeling in Analytics Academy for Women. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, a grand challenge strengthening, strengthening modeling for Tunisia, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, this initiative is uh, one of the first grand challenge global call to action in Tunisia, so we are very proud to have it here in Pasteur Institute. And as I said, it's uh, an initiative call, uh, for Grand Challenge call, Global Call to Action. It's a challenge under gender equality data. The funding duration is from September 2023 until August 2026. So it's for three years. And Pasteur Institute of Tunis is the principal investigator, it was institution principal investigator of this project. So uh, this project was not possible if we don't have our partners in this, uh, in this amazing initiative. So the consortium with the, with the leading institution is, firstly, as I said before, where we are the in our and then the Institute of Pasteur and Kamu, led by Dr. George Shepson, 
then Mabari University of Science and Technology, led by uh, Jean Louis Bazira, CRMS, uh, the uh, Centre de Recherche Médicale et Sanitaire du Niger, led by Ramatoulay uh, Lazomar, uh, then CIMA Center for Ophthalmological Modeling and Analysis from Kenya, led by Motono uh, Nayame, and finally, a new uh, institution in our consortium. Initially, it was not partner, but we are ha very happy and proud to have uh, them with us. Uh, Pastor of Bangui uh, from Central African Republic, represented by Yabum. Uh, Yabum is not present with us today, but please, uh, thank you for being here and presenting. Thank you. So, 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 so,
gender desegregated, with gender desegregated data, and our aim is to publish Atlas two publication each year with the different partners, and, but I'm sure it will be more than that. Um, then we have the activity which is leveraging partnership, so it will be a collaborative project undertaken by African model, which means that the mentorship will be collaborative between at least at minimum two institutions, which means each PhD student in each postdoc will have mobility between different institutions. For example, our student will have mobility in Tunisia between uh, Pasteur Dakar because they have expertise in statistics, uh, which we don't have in our laboratory. We have some of it, but we are not really experts, and we are uh, looking for excellence. And we uh, also have mobility with uh, SEMA, uh, the, uh, the Center of Excellence in Epidemiology. Also, the student from Dakar will come to Tunisia or will come to go to Cameroon. Student from Cam Cameroon will come to Tunisia uh, and Dakar. And student from data providers are the ones that will benefit from this. Uh, training because uh, the institution that are only data providers don't have structure of mathematical modeling. So our aim is really to uh, induce to new structure in their institution through uh, this new generation of mathematical models. Um, at the end, uh, the, thir the last activity is knowledge translation, which is really the link or uh, establishing the bridge with the policy makers. For that, we will, we will organize workshops uh, in schools where policy makers are participants and partner, and also why not um, trainer uh, in this uh, uh, workshop and uh, uh, in schools. So uh, here's some idea about the research subject, which is uh, which our multi-country approach data analysis model. As I said before, we are interested in HPV. For that, we are more interested in statistical analysis. And with the expert Jules Chan Chuang and uh, his team, we will uh, try to look on uh, and the, uh, we will try to analyze the historical aspect of HPV in Cameroon to help. Uh, taking decision and uh, start vaccination, implementing vaccination strategy there. And we, using the data from Tunisia, we will understand what's happened before uh, vaccination implementation. And certainly we will try to uh, uh, work more on maternal transmission prevalence because it's very important for many countries in Africa. Then we have the project HPV. Uh, uh, there is a cancer, uh, cervical cancer challenge here. We are addressing the burden with cost-benefit simulation in game theory. And in our uh, lab, we are uh, experts on prediction and dynamical model in game theory model. So we will give a lot of our expertise for the different partners in this aspect. And with the help of uh, Nadia uh, Raisi, uh, our colleague from uh, uh, Morocco, uh, she's a specialist in cost effectiveness and game theory models. Uh, we will have a lot of help and uh, collaboration with her, sure. Uh, we will use the data of many countries in this case. We have data from Tunisia and from uh, Cameroon. No, from Niger, I'm sorry, from Niger. Then we have project COVID-19, and here we will add the gender NIMAC, the gender aspect to COVID-19, which is not really treated in many models. Uh, and we want to unveil the unknowns in COVID-19 transmission dynamics. Uh, then we have the project. Uh, this, is, this project is all for all members that have data. We know, we know that we have a lot of data uh, around COVID-19 everywhere, so it will be very, very useful to, to learn from them. And then we have the project antimicrobial resistance. We will be focusing on women's health, certainly, which means pathogens that are specific to women. And our aim is to provide, uh, to make analysis and to provide adaptive dynamics for understanding and predicting why there is resistance in population. And for that, we will use data from our team in Uganda and uh, in uh, our, some partner, with some partner here in Tunisia. As you see, there is different subjects. However, be sure we can use different kind of models for different problematic in health. So for example, we will use dynamical and predictive model, like structured model for the different disease. We'll do the same with economical model because cost effectiveness for vaccination and for any kind of um, prevention is very important. Uh, and very important for low and middle income countries, this is sure. We have also multi-Asian multi models. We have experts here in our lab. 
uh, and to add complexity if there is a lot of complexity in the uh, these that we, we want to uh, analyze. And certainly if we have a lot of data, which is the case of COVID-19 in antimicrobial resistance, we can use intelli uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning modeling. So here the project of environment, I already told you a lot about, about it. So the idea is like uh, during these three years, we will organize each year a school. The first school was in Tunisia in MedTech. So I want to thank MedTech for the amazing organization that was, uh, facil uh, was really uh, helpful for us, knowing that in public structure, it's very, very difficult sometimes to get results easily. but. Pastoral Institute sometimes is an exemption in many ways uh, comparing to other institutions, and MedTech helped us a lot on that also. So some part of it was funded by Pastoral Institute, and some uh, of it is funded by MedTech via the project AMAX. And uh, the second year will be uh, in, uh, with Jules uh, in uh, uh, Center Pastor of Cameroon, and the third year, year will be in SEMA uh, in Kenya with uh, uh, Motono. And also, as I told you, we will have PhD with us. So there is monitoring and mobility between different institutions. And this PhD student and postdoc will move with us each year for the school and also the first cohort. So we got the first cohort during our first school, AMAC school, and we are now looking for more funding to be able to uh, give uh, the student of the first cohort the possibility to get more learning in mathematical modeling for the other schools. Um, here the uh, project work package to be able to do all of these activities we need work package and we need people so here the most important people of uh, our project so the work package one uh, around the management and communication we have Dr. Yasmin Kirfeshi from Medtech Institute is she is the pro uh, project manager of uh, of this uh, AMAX of, of this project. And Dr. Ahlem Xara, as Slimane said, is one of the most important for our team because she's make, she makes the bridge with the policy makers. Uh, she was uh, ex heads of DSSP. So um, her expertise is very important. Thanks for being with us and being in our team. So she will be the communication manager. In, in our team, and uh, uh, Ilham Ben Ali, uh, our assistant in, uh, in Pasteur for this project, our manager in Pasteur Institute for, for this project. She did a lot for this, uh, both events, uh, the workshop in the school, so thanks a lot, Ilham, for all of the work that you have done for us. And uh, Sonia Arbi, uh, uh, the IPT grant office manager, she's the one that was responsible of all of the, of the SAMP grants, so I thank you a lot for all the work that you have done until now. And for work package two, one of the most important work package because it's about research. Uh, so uh, here the principal investigator of this work package, Professor Slimane Bilmilet from Pasteur Institute and Professor uh, Joel Bazira from MAST, uh, Uganda. Uh, thanks for being with us also. Uh, work package three, which is about uh, training and school organization, which is led by uh, uh, Dr. Dora Luetti, associated professor from uh, uh, MedTech and also a member of BEAM's laboratory here in Pasteur Institute, and uh, Dr. Uh, Mariam Diara uh, from uh, Past Pasteur Institute in Dakar. Uh, uh, she uh, also responsible of preparing the program for the school and uh, the training uh, agenda. So thanks, Mariam. Uh, also, for the work package four, the most important one, there is a lot of things to do in it. it is, it's, a, it's really a new initiation for data sharing in, in mathematical modeling with uh, uh, Professor Jules Chan Chuang, a researcher from uh, Santa Pasteur of Cameroon, and uh, Simon Kaoma, a researcher from MAST University in Uganda. Thanks for collaborating with us in this project. So here are our primary outcomes. This is what we want to achieve at the end of this project. First, we want to increase the danger and additional modeling and analytics capacity. Also, increase data-driven evidence for policy making for women health issues in our countries. Um, uh, how to say, um, ameliorate, ameliorate, improve improve gender and social modeling infrastructure, uh, capacity needs in the ecosystem for women's health in low and middle income country and specifically for our country. 
uh, we will create a country light modeling platform where we will share all of our models. They will be open for, uh, for everyone. Uh, it's not the case maybe for data. The data will be shared only with members, but we will try to push for data sharing with everyone. Okay? Then, uh, at the end, um, our aim, our goal really for this project is to improve women and girls' health and, uh, and livelihood through better data and estimation, failing gender gaps, and accelerating progress towards gender equality. So uh, after eight months here uh, of the project, here are our achievements. Uh, and we did a lot for just eight months with a lot of struggle with budget transfer. Uh, in fact, uh, the recent updates involve uh, refining modeling approach, gathering HPV and antimicrobial resistance data in collaboration with our partners, and advancing capacity building through establishment of scientific committee, PhD projects, uh, the organization of the first AMAX uh, school, and also collaborating with any uh, many associations, among them is Tawhida Bishikh organization that we will work with in HPV data. So we are trying really hardly for antimicrobial resistance in Tunisia, in HPV for Tunisia right now and Senegal to get more data with different institutions. And right now we selected seven PhD and postdocs. We still need to select more uh, two PhD. We are almost there. All of the project re research are well established. Certainly after the AMAC school, we have more questions, we have more idea, and even the student helped a lot uh, on creating this new idea. So it was amazing really. Then, uh, for evidence-based decision-making and leveraging partnership, the team expanding communication aligned with the Ministry of Health in Tunisia, engaged National HPV Focal Point, hosted successful two, uh, one workshop. Uh, the first workshop, as Liman said, was in 10 November with the help of uh, Dr. Ilham Zara. In fact, Ilham Zara uh, joined the team, uh, as I said before, uh, as an expert in public health, and uh, she's uh, the focal point for policymakers. And uh, with uh, Sliman uh, 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 Ahlem, sorry, Ahlem Zara, we, uh, uh, we uh, organized uh, our successful first workshop in 10 of, of November two, 2023, which uh, was focusing in public health modeling and decision making for women, specifically for, specifically for HPV. And we have also the upcoming event workshop in 7 and 8 of March with all of our partners here for, uh, we will be working uh, specifically on antimicrobial resistance, HPV, and uh, COVID-19. We will show you some uh, games. Uh, Dora Sliman and Hezer, uh, one of our members in the lab, will, uh, do, will play games with you to understand mod modeling tomorrow, okay? And um, now, right now, uh, for partnership with the, uh, uh, Association, we are uh, actively working to establish a partnership with, uh, as I said before, the Hida Bishir Group for research and action in women's health, focusing on advancing sexual and reproductive rights and uh, impactful research in women's health. We are also actively working to establish a partnership with the National Family and Population Office. So that's all. Uh, to end, to finish this presentation, in fact, this is what we are trying to do. Mathematics is not just solve for, for X, it's also figuring out why we care about X. This is the reason why we, do, we are doing mathematics in, initially. It can be a science in, each, in itself, but it can help a lot. Uh, so the project, in fact, is the result of a hard work by a team. Please stand up, team, all of the team, all of our partner, please stand up. And let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. If you have any question, please, all of us can respond. It was clear. OK. No question? Now we have the coffee break, and uh, after that we will have the great lecture from our, one of our pantry, Dr. Thambi. Thank you.
Test ise andu. Ha? Tam bir şey. Test andu. Andu. Test. Ay, andu, test, ise andu. Bırsan mı klahda kan kusaliyek. Test andu. Test, ise. Le ana kas mı ne? Tam tas mafsala, ha? Tam. Test, ise andu. جاونا بي يا الله يا كريم بسم الله تيست اندو ايسي عاود رجع له قول له سي بون مريقل ها برسمك عاود ابعث له منصر هذي بالله يزيد ابعث له ها سيماش فلوس سي بون اي اما هما نسمع في ميريكل اوكي ميرسي
Alof, IC, test, 1, 2, test, C, 2, test, 1, 2. Niveau, qui me dit que tu as IC, test, test, 1, 2. Noor, c'est bon. Test 1, 2, ici. Test 1, 2, test. Ici, 1, 2, test. Ici, 1, 2, test. 1, 2, test. Allô, ici, test 1, 2, test. Ici, 1, 2, test. Ici, C'est bon, on régle. Micro 1, test. 1, 2, micro 1. Micro 1, test. 1, 2, test, test. Micro 1, 1, 2. Micro 2, micro 2, test, ici, 1, 2, c'est, nous allons faire micro 3, ma,
will welcome Tambi with us in Tunisia. And uh, Tambi, I, I met Tambi, it was uh, last year, two years ago mm -hmm. on, uh, in Kenya. On, uh, on, uh, like, uh, say it was a meeting on, um, for Modla in order to think about what, what, what should go wrong and what should go well for COVID-19 epidemic. And it was a very pleasure to, to meet you again. It was a very pleasure to meet you at that time and uh, to meet you again here. So I welcome you. So he is present uh, a, a talk on uh, modeling in, in Africa, the experience they, they have in SEMA and uh, what, goes go what, go what, was, what goes well, what goes wrong. <laughs> and on all this, and uh, also the, I see the difficulties that uh, we have for modeling and data in Africa. So thank you very much, Tambi, and uh, please. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Simon, for that. I think it's good morning. Um, when I looked at the program, and so I had been given two hours <laughs> to give a plenary talk, I questioned whether I'm a politician or a preacher, because <laughs> they can handle two hours pretty easy. Um, but it's really nice for the invitation, I really appreciate, and uh, congratulations on AMAX uh, and what you're doing already, and hopefully this is going to be transformative for, for, for Tunisia and for the continent. I thought I should start with this image here because it, it serves as part of my story on science and policy. It's a nice animal, it's called the, the hedgehog. I'll tell you a little bit about the, ha the hedgehog in a minute, but uh, what I hope to discuss with you in this, uh, I promise I'll not kill you by slides, so I'm not taking the whole two hours. There'll be plenty of time for questions. On public health policy modeling for Africa. As a young PhD student, uh, this is 2008, that's when I started my, my PhD. I got a chance to go and, 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 and do the studies at the University of Edinburgh, and I met a gentleman by the name of Professor Mark Woolhouse. Before going there, I used to work at the International Livestock Research Institute, which is headquartered in Nairobi, and it's a research for development institute. So when the director general stood, and whenever scientists stood, they always talked about livestock as a way out of poverty. So as a young master student then, livestock was connected to me as a development issue. So when I started uh, my PhD, we were asked that in eight weeks, we should provide a, a document about 10 pages describing how your PhD research would look like. And my entire eight pages was describing livestock as an important pathway out of poverty for people on the continent. And I thought that was what science was about, like you could influence policy almost immediately. That's why I showed the picture of livestock there. And I think with a bit of uh, careful imagination, my supervisor at the time called me and said, look, for the next four years, you and I are going to do a PhD. I want you to forget about the importance of cows. It's not about cattle. It's about good science. Think of the species you're working with as a tool. Think of cows as a hedgehog. It has no importance. I mean, possibly it's not right. Hedgehogs have importance. And, and, and that formed my idea about what I was to spend four years doing, gaining skills, and he said, if you have good scientific skills, you will be able to talk to policy. You will have credibility that will allow people to come to you and ask questions because you are grounded on science. And maybe that I thought would be a nice story to give away to particularly the AMAX PhD students who are starting that however much we have these important diseases, I think you got to develop really good scientific skills, and those can allow you to have an impact on policy many uh, days down the line. So I thought I should actually give you a summary of three key points that I learned in my early career as a, as a, as a young postdoc and as a young uh, PhD student then. 
One of the key lessons, I think, that's important, perhaps, that allows me to be invited to give a two-hour plenary talk, which <laughs> I think is incredible, <laughs> is there are people around you that train you, and I'll call them mentors or cheerleaders. Their support, I think, is absolutely critical. We are what we are sometimes because of the interactions we have with the people that trained us. The second bit is, and I actually learned this not too long ago, that even though I had thought of hedgehogs in the context of what my PhD supervisor told me, there's actually a famous uh, concept called the hedgehog concept, and it comes from business. And it's, uh, I think, very well captured in a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And the hedgehog concept, uh, after studying many businesses that do great and those that don't do great, they found that businesses that do great focus on one thing that they can be best in the world for. I think it's, it's a story, a fox would know many things, but a hedgehog knows one big thing, right? Um, and, 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 and I think what I have learned out of that is that it does really help to be grounded in something and to have a growing research and direction. And that if that is connected to relevant societal questions, it might actually be quite impactful. The third point I wanted to make is um, a supportive environment is really critical. I mean, there's a reason why um, the world goes to Caroline Trotter and her team at Cambridge. <laughs> sorry for mentioning your name, or Oxford or other big institutions, uh, because there is an amount of um, supportive research system, or at least credibility, that, that has been built over time. And I think that's part of what like Amax is also trying to build. Like Among ourselves, we can create a supportive research environment for four women, uh, I think it's with and for women, um, collaborations and networks. And, and I think those collaborations and networks are really critical because you bring in a lot of different aspects of thinking about the same messy problem. Um, and keeping things new is great because then it keeps your mind uh, young and, 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 and thinking to, to, to address big societal issues. And so I thought, this is actually life about people. Like, if I look at my career and what I benefited from, it starts from when I joined a first, as first year at the Invite to Nairobi, and I met a gentleman, the first gentleman there, his name is Professor Kiyama, who now is the Vice Chancellor of the Invite to Nairobi. And as a young veterinary student, I studied veterinary medicine for my first degree, he took me aside and said, you could make a very good veterinarian, I suspect if you repair broken limbs of dogs and cats that in 10 years will be bored, that as a veterinarian you can actually be a researcher and maybe you will handle one problem after another and you can keep your mind there. And he sort of enticed me to think about research as an alternative way from just being a clinician that, that uh, supported the veterinary work. Then I met a gentleman by the name Francis Makodimba, the second gentleman there when I was doing my master's. He had just finished his PhD. In fact, in the institute, he was not a famous scientist. He's a young PhD who has just completed, and he mentored me really great. He, he, he gave me time, which I think is what we can offer our students. Giving them time allows them to grow. And then I went on to the University of Edinburgh, met the gentleman who told me about Hedgehog, and I have had lots of other people come through. When I wanted to apply for a Wellcome Trust Fellowship, I, went, I wanted people who work on rabies, and I found two fantastic persons from the University of Glasgow, Sarah Cleveland and uh, Katie Hampson, who mentored me as a, as a young postdoctoral fellow. And that's how I actually met Calora and Trotter through Katie Hampson. So the networks, again, <laughs> become important. So to finalize that first part of my talk is to say, those are lessons I learned as a young person, what lessons do I have now? I think mentors, networks are still really important. And good leadership of whatever programs or whatever institute you are, and institutional and financial resources are as important as having a good idea. 
The one that is connected a lot more to the talk about policy and modeling is the niche and relevance of the work that we as scientists have to think of society as a place where we are needed and can make a positive contribution to. Ultimately, it's about not just people, but the right people in the right seats and doing meaningful work. So we are fortunate at the Invitro Nairobi at the Center for Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis, SEMA, to have a group of young people that are working towards this meaningful work. So what will my talk be about? Science and policy nexus, should they mix? And I hope by the end of the talk, you will be able to answer these questions or feel confident that uh, I have provided some insights. <laughs> Is modeling good science for policy? Um, has modeling been of any use for Africa's health? And the last is, if modeling is really good for Africa, how do we make it as ubiquitous as weather forecast? Every evening at the end of the news, there's somebody who tells you about the next day, right? About your weather for the next day, next week, and that all comes from modeling. Is it possible for a policy modeling to be that common and in use? So I thought, because this is the age of the AI, how about I ask <laughs> being co-pilot, what is policy, what is science? And I think it gave me results that were a bit poetic. So what science? Celestial voyage of curiosity and files it sails upon the vast ocean of knowledge. I think the key words here is the art of unraveling the cosmic tapestry, stitching together units with threads of observation and experimentation. Essentially, science is pursuit of timeless truths about our universe. Whereas policy is a little bit of a delicate tapestry woven by hands of governance. It's about decision making. It's about creating some form of compass or blueprint that guides how we as a nation or as a continent move forward. So essentially, I think from those uh, AI co-pilot definitions, you could say that there's actually some form of divergence between science and policy. Because science is concerned with our best timeless understanding of the natural world rather than just current affairs. But policy is muddled uh, with many conflicting interests. In fact, policy is not formed, I think, when government is in place. It starts being formed when governments are asking for your votes to vote them in. They convince you with promises of how they are going to address health, the rising unemployment, the difficulties of dealing with climate change. They form some ideas, some political ideals, and then they get into office and immediately start battling with practicalities of the promises that they made. So essentially, you would say, with policy, it's temporal, it's around the current affairs, whereas science seeks to know the truth, and the truth in its ultimate from observation experimentation, and we keep improving. You know, we form a hypothesis, we test that hypothesis against data, against experiments, and eventually we have some form of understanding that we stick with until more evidence shows up that can drive our, our thinking as to how the phenomena work moving forward. But if science and policy differ, then do you have a role as scientist in that context? I would actually argue that, and there's a nice book here by uh, Heather D. E. Douglas that talks about science policy and the value-free ideal. That actually science and policy are quite connected. They are entangled. There's one, one end you have policy for science and one end you have science for policy. We accuse our governments of not putting money into science, essentially not having a policy for science. And then governments sometimes accuse us 
of doing science that has no policy relevance. It's, it's, it's a nice connection to think about. We commit our public funds allocated to doing science, and then the big question is what programs do we fund? So you sort of need a policy for science. But my talk today will be more on the second one, science for policy. What technical information do we base our regulations, do we base our laws, do we use for public decision making? I think there's no doubt that science has been making big contribution in policy. In fact, there's need for regular science advice, and that is rarely questioned. I think the debate is usually on which science is most trustworthy. And a, and a particular example is modeling like around outbreaks. What do we believe? Whose model is right? And I hope that as scientists here, not these tiny people that politicians can pull on the table and say, <laughs> here's our science advisor, that we still remain with a ability to think of the unfaltered truth about how the universe works, grounded on science. So I thought I should actually spend just a few more minutes showing us that the question about policy and science is not a recent question. It has been, in fact, the development of like mathematical models was a lot based on, on, on this idea that you could support big decisions that the society would move towards to, based on uh, a bit more analysis. And, and I would recommend, uh, particularly for the people just starting into this, to read the nice uh, short history of mathematical uh, population dynamics book, which I think lays a number of these examples pretty well. And I'll use a few examples, uh, some of our work and others that have happened long before I was born, to illustrate this. So I start with the policy question. And this is a policy question that is from hundreds of years ago, smallpox. At the time, they had found out that people who got a little bit of a scratch and you put in a bit of smallpox got a bit of mild disease that when the real infection came through, they did not end up with death. But this was a controversial issue. Should you use this? variolation as a way of dealing with the problem of, of smallpox. And so Daniel Banoeli, I think, is a really good illustration of trying to answer a debatable societal question regarding the practices that could be done and must, and what would be the impact of that at the society level. And so the two questions that he possibly tried to answer were should government implement variolation of all individuals? Should you vaccinate everyone, quote unquote? And what would be the benefit of that? So you sort of have to come up with a metric that would be understandable and possibly useful to the bigger society. And in this case, the metric was, we all wanna live long on this earth. <laughs> so how about life expectancy? So the result of that was that out of the analysis that this variolation was advantageous, particularly if the risk of dying with the infection from smallpox was greater than 11%. And I think the, the nice metric here is that should you do it, if should you uh, do this practice on people at birth, the life expectancy of the population at the time would move by a whole 1,000 days, three years. So from 26 years and seven months, to 29 years and eight months. Essentially, I think governments are looking for this kind of big wins. Maybe the, the, the name is not even government. Society is looking for why should we move our laws and regulations to a certain direction, not to be the benefit at an individual level, but also at a societal level. And I think one quote about quote, from Daniel Banoeli is, I simply wish that in a matter 
which so closely concerns the well-being of the human race, no decision shall be made without all the knowledge which a little analysis and calculation can provide. In my experience, um, working with people who make decisions, they, they, they run their own mental models of what's the impact of one direction vis-a-vis -vis another. And I think that, that is true everywhere. Ideally, what you want is a health decision not just be based on gut feelings or mental models, but to be based on insights that you can derive from data analytics and epidemiological models. I, I realize that you possibly prepare for the students who attended the course, you already learned about ROS um, in your introduction to mathematical models. But he had sort of made great strides in understanding what was the source of uh, malaria. He actually used birds to indicate that, you know, this is related to mosquitoes. And his claim that malaria can be eradicated simply by reducing the number of mosquitoes met with a lot of skepticism. And so he turns to simplifying the world in mathematical terms, uh, build a transmission model for malaria to support his claim. I think the main argument or the main result out of uh, that analysis for was that if the number of mosquitoes then is reduced below the critical threshold, the only steady state would be I is equal to zero, which means that you'd stop seeing malaria within the human population. That malaria would disappear. And again, he quotes that attributed to him that I think are quite nice. Says, as a matter of fact, or epidemiology concerned as it is with the variation of disease from time to time or from place to place must be considered mathematically, however many variables are implicated if it is to be considered scientifically at all. And for the students of epidemiology that we love factors associated with diseases, I think here is a challenge that to say that our disease depends upon certain factors is not to say much until he can also form an estimate as to how largely each factor influences the whole result. And the mathematical method of treatment is really nothing but the application of careful reasoning to the problems at issue. I mean, you, you can extend it to any issue that you're dealing with today, policy issues, policy options. And then question, can we use our science and skills to try and provide careful reasoning to the problems at issue? And I would not dwell on malaria a lot, but I think there have been fantastic progress in that field. Uh, in fact, there are people who think elimination is possible, others think eradication is possible, and their arguments how math models can support uh, each of their reasoning, and I would recommend maybe reading a few of these articles. Is that a mark that my one hour is over? I have one more hour. <laughs> Great. Because we are limited in resources, one might wonder, should we spend all our resources to reach every case, maybe with an intervention like vaccination? Or is there a certain number that if you arrive at, you still manage to deal, away, to deal away with the disease? And I think the works, the very early works of William Kamek and uh, Anderson McKedrick are really a research of this. And they were answering important questions. Is there, uh, uh, is it when there are no more susceptible persons present? Is that the time that an epidemic does change? Or is it an interplay of factors of maybe the virulence of the pathogen has changed? recovery or mortality, whereas there are many susceptible individuals still present. These are sort of like critical questions that we answer today, like what proportion of people need to be vaccinated for us to stop seeing measles cases, or to stop seeing um, uh, HIV rising? 
So they formed really nice uh, models, like really simple models that you already discussed in your lectures, um, and fitted it on data that came from uh, Bombay in India. And I think then this magical number, the elegant way of describing pandemics in almost a nice, or epidemics in one, one nice metric, the R0, uh, came out of that initial work. which is when you deplete the susceptible individuals to a level that you cannot see an epidemic rising. Again, this concept is a concept available to us and can be applied on very many of our public health problems that we deal with today. But I would say it's not just the works of uh, Ross and uh, Kamik and others that modeling for policy has been in use even for non-infectious things. I think one nice example I learned not too long ago was the China's one child policy. Now if you sort of look through uh, history, there's a period of time that there were some policies that didn't do great, particularly in China, in the 50s up to the early 70s there was something they called four modernizations. Part of that was to improve agriculture, and part of the responses was to do away with, with sparrows. Um, so they, there's an attempt to clear sparrows from the field, and that changed the dynamics of how production happened. There was an attempt to go into um, different agricultural ways of producing food. And it's actually, in the, you can read it on Wikipedia and other places, but the, some of the government officials were so enthusiastic that to show production was increasing, they kept food a way that people did not access. And in fact, it's recorded as one of the greatest man-made famines, where lots and in the tens of millions of people died out of starvation as food was being kept in stores to show that the policy was working. And so that's, that's sort of the scenario that is, at least as I understand it in China at the time, and in the beginning of 70s, there's already a worry like we have today. Can the planet hold this number of people? And there are projections as to what would be the population of China given 20, 30 years from then. And so they actually turned to a person, a, a mathematician, who had been trained in Russia, used to work on, um, on, on mathematics and mechanics study of dynamical systems whose behavior depends on some parameters, and then turned his attention to demography, making an estimate what would happen if the fertility rates or the number of children was a parameter that could be influenced. And so they created this model um, to look at the size and growth of Chinese population, which would have been perceived as one of the obstacles to these modernizations. And that's how the one-child policy came about. It came about with just getting the demographic projections in billions as hypothesized uh, mean number of children per woman. Um, so, so here you have one, and then you increase by 1.5, 2, uh, 2.53, moving upwards. And the policy was born out of a model. But it's not just that, like in the early uh, 90s when HIV starts becoming a big issue uh, in populations of, uh, um, first of all started with uh, men who have sex with men and then you know uh, it started growing a lot more on the continent here. And very early on I found like this paper that was done by Roy Anderson and, and his team looking at the potential of community-wide chemotherapy or immunotherapy to control the spread of HIV. 
And, you know, they, they were looking at, um, I think, a drug, uh, AZT, and if it was offered to symptom, uh, symptom, um, people without symptoms um, who have been infected with HIV, um, would, would that delay AIDS? And they make some important observations here that by using that simple mathematical model, they show that community treatment with antiviral uh, drugs or immunotherapeutic, uh, that could lengthen the incubation period of people with HIV without significantly reducing infectiousness. That that would possibly lead to what was fairly obvious, an increase in the rate of HIV infection. And in the long run, what those drugs were trying to minimize, which is increase the AIDS-related deaths rate in the community, which is less obvious. When I looked at the paper, some of the struggles at the time were people who get onto those drugs, those early drugs. They had shown, some studies had shown that after six months to one year, their infectiousness or infectivity was similar to pre-treatment. And so there's the argument that if, if then you have lots of people at a community level who are like that and continually having uh, risky behaviors, then that you could end up with, um, with HIV even be, being a greater problem. But they make like really nice comments and, and requests that there ought to be clinical trials that show what happens to your ability to pass on the infection once you're on drugs, because that was an unfamiliar uh, question answered at the time. And in fact, I think 10 years later, a lot more work had been done, and the first model started showing that treatment of people in mass, those who, had, uh, who would be tested and found to, to be positive, did not only have an impact on the individual, but on the community. And so this, this, this nice work, like on universal voluntary HIV testing with immediate antiretroviral therapy as a strategy for elimination of HIV has been perhaps one of the biggest contributors to the reduction in uh, HIV cases uh, on the continent and everywhere. And they did it by you know, creating a model um, and then determining at what point should we test people. If you remember not too long ago, before you'd only get into be treated for HIV when your CD4 counts went really low, like when you're almost really in a bad state, that's when you'd be started on antitroviral. And the argument here from models was actually do it much earlier. As soon as you tested and you're positive, treat that person because they are less likely to, to, to infect other people. And that way you can have a, um, a, a population level impact of uh, reducing HIV. And so here they show um, uh, if you have no intervention, uh, if you got your ART reduced to about 350, which was the former policy that test people once you get to a very low CD4 count or your protection body immunity is down, start the treatment, or what would happen if you had universal voluntary HIV testing and immediate ART. And I think policies like mothers who are pregnant, once they get to hospital, the first thing they do is, as part of the antenatal, is test them. So as in case they are HIV positive, you support them so as the baby is not positive, but also immediately start on ARTs. And that, I think, has had not just what the models were predicting, but an actual impact on the incidence of HIV on the continent. And this is how I knew Colorine Trotter from dogs. <laughs> so I'll give you a story about rabies, which is one of my favorite uh, topics. So um, a lot of places here on the continent, you have no idea how many dogs you have got. We don't register our dogs. Uh, sometimes in the villages, people keep lots of dogs. Like this gentleman here in Western Kenya came to one of our vaccination sites rabies vaccination sites, and he came with 48 dogs. And they all look quite obedient to him, right? Um, 
Rabies is a viral disease. Almost all cases of rabies come from domestic dogs. There are places you have a few other sources like bats, but most of the burden of the rabies in the, in the world comes from domestic dogs. You, you can stop cases in humans by making sure that dogs don't transmit the disease among themselves. So as one of the, the responses to this old age disease is vaccinate dogs against rabies vaccine, which I think is connected very well with the Institute pasture, because that's, that's part of the initial work on rabies. Um, and as you do it, you will see less and less of cases in dogs and the dogs that bite you, because dogs bite always bite people, but if a dog bites you without rabies, it's, 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 it's less dangerous. Um, so you need to vaccinate dogs, but in the meantime, before you eliminate the, the, the rabies virus in the population of dogs, any human who gets bitten has a very small chance of survival in the absence of a post-exposure vaccine. So in my country, in other places where rabies is rampant, rampant, you need any person who gets bitten to immediately access the rabies vaccine. Which makes it one of like 100% vaccine preventable diseases because you have two places you can get it at, at the dog level, but also should a human get exposed, you can also sort them out before they form clinical disease. Once you have clinical disease of rabies, there is really no chance of survival. What we know from observing in our population, people don't always get their rabies vaccines once they get exposed. Here we have some raw data uh, showing the days to the first time they get the rabies vaccines once they are exposed. You want most of, if not everyone, getting their first dose of post-exposure prophylaxis on day zero, on the day of the, they're, they're beaten. But the distribution is, I can see there are people who come in 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, and sometimes it's too late. Part of this societal problem is, first of all, rabies vaccine for humans is an on-demand vaccine. You get it when you have been exposed or when you've had a bite. It's, like, it's not like the measles vaccine where you get, by, by being born, <laughs> you get the vaccine. This one is by being bitten, you start looking for the vaccine. It's also an expensive vaccine um, in the range of about $100 to get your full dose. And that's not common money for everyone. So people do make actual life choices that I've been bitten by a dog, I think it's possibly not rabies, I'm not going to spend $100 and then it's a bit too late. What happens is you then see deaths out of rabies in the population very much related to socioeconomic status. Like places where the, the governments are able to provide the post-exposure prophylaxis very close to where people get bitten, you have less and less of rabies deaths where the vaccine is not available, where people are not able to buy the vaccine, you see more and more of rabies deaths. So the question is, is it possible as a society for us to respond to that inequity issue of access to rabies vaccines? And right there is a nice policy question because there are institutions like Gavi that, you know, whose job is to try and remove the cost barriers that make people not access the appropriate health. And here I show a real case, uh, because sometimes you might live all your life and never see a rabies cases because of where we live. But we see those cases all the time. And here is an RDT, um, a quick test that you can do in the field that shows a positive case here for a person. And if you read the doctor's uh, notes, they say there's history of hotness of the body, this carrier fever, uh, general body malaise, associated rest, uh, restlessness, insomnia, and bizarre behavior. 
which is associated with rabies, and they have a history of a dog bite. Now the problem is that this, this kind of description of a clinical case happens quite often, and the disease is not said to be rabies, because if you take a blood sample of somebody who lives in, in a malaria endemic area, you most likely are going to see parasites. So when somebody presents much later with these kind of cases that are bizarre, that have uh, you know, neurological symptoms, it's not difficult to allocate that case to be a cerebral malaria as opposed to, to rabies. So it becomes quite often, and, 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 and that reduced number of rabies cases that get reported makes the thing appear not like a public health important disease. And so people that work on rabies for many years have been trying to push that can the rabies post-exposure vaccines be part of the vaccines that get funded through processes like Gavi to remove the cost barrier and stop deaths due to rabies. I started working on rabies around 2012, 2013, and here is a statement about Gavi, uh, you know, major player in, um, in, in minimizing uh, costs due to vaccine preventable deaths by removing the cost barrier. And they say, with a view to prioritize vaccines providing good value for money, cost effectiveness, and with the highest impact of the disease, the Gavi board shortlisted five options for further evaluation, the malaria vaccines, oral cholera vaccines, seasonal influenza, uh, for pregnant women, and rabies vaccines for post-exposure prophylaxis as an investment um, in additional mass campaigns with yellow fever vaccines. And so a group of people from different places, from different countries provided data, and then there was a WHO modeling consortium that uh, people that used to work on rabies, they were informed you do need to make sure you get people that work on cost effectiveness for other vaccines enter teams uh, like Color and Trotter and others, and they, they work together to have a business case or a case informed of modeling on why Gavi should make an investment in this rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. And I show you data that sh just shows what, what, what were the results like for Kenya. So here we have, I'll just uh, focus on this one graphic here. Um, on the y-axis here is death from rabies in thousands. Every year we estimate about 3,000 people die from rabies or 2,500 die from rabies every year in Kenya. And then you have got one potential policy option which is in yellow here and uh, improved access to PEP vaccines. So what if PEP vaccines were available to every person that gets beaten? what would happen to cases of rabies over time. And here is the blue one is, what if you do not only provide vaccines for people, but also you vaccinate dogs, which is a source of, um, which is a source of uh, the virus for humans. And you can see over a period of time, you know, projected to 2035, that the combination of improving access to post-exposure prophylaxis for humans and also vaccinating dogs would bring you to what would be success. And that that was a cost-effective uh, approach to it. And so I think the results came in well published. They made uh, Gavi make some responses and uh, Gavi, you know, in 2018 said yes, they would make an investment. And as they were preparing for this investment, a big guy called COVID came and COVID really distracted them. And so for a period of time, the Gavi investment on rabies was delayed, but really glad that is now happening. But that's a global, that's a global um, response. Nations, countries have to be able to adopt and say, how do we start improving access to post-exposure prophylaxis, rabies, vaccines, once they come in. And so, the models are great at global level, they make the financing happen, but at country level you sort of need also your own country-led uh, modeling effort 
to show how do you best do your immunization program, what are the methods, where should you place your vaccines, all those are important questions that need to be localized uh, at county level. So I hope by that number of slides that have convinced you that you know modeling has some use, both in historical but also current co uh, contemporary issues. And so I'd like now to spend time on what lessons I'm learning and what lessons we are learning as a, as a modeling community on the continent. Uh, and so the first question is, what is modeling success? Um, we are trying to develop through AMAX and any other initiative, this group of clever, motivated modeling teams who are driven to engage and, and, and that once we engage, we would have healthy and productive uh, nations of Tunisia, Cameroon, Niger, and other places. It, it possibly would look like this straightforward, right? But it's not. There's a lot more to it. It's not just having modelers. There need to be other parts that play an important role. And this is what we learn. The first thing is, with your clever, motivated modeling teams engaged, you, you, you need to know what questions, what are the policy options government are struggling with? Because the accusation you have in the scientific world is doing a blue sky science that has no absolute relevance. Having an ear listening to what are the needs, what are the policy options they are struggling with, and how can those be modeled is as critical as having your clever, motivated modeling teams. And then mechanisms of sharing those modeling insights with the right people. For our own careers, we love publications, because that's what maybe our bosses will look at. That's one nice appropriate place, and make sure you always put it there. But for policy, you do need to identify who are the people that those results need to be given to in a much more simplified way and practical connected to the policy options they have got. And then, should this work, then there are some wheels of public health that have to move. And those are not instant. They depend on many things. They depend on financing, they depend on the time of the year, <laughs> they depend on many things. But you sort of have to be consistent to make these wheels of public health to move. And as they move, I think that's where you get your healthy and productive nation, which is what you hoped to get there. Just that you use slightly a different path for policy modeling. And I think the, the, the starting point is to think about policy modeling and use cases, um, both at national and also subnational level. So I've left the global arena. The global arena is, is sorted. We have GAVIs, we have big funders like Gates who use modeling to decide where to make their investments. You have WHO that uses mod modeling to get guidelines that can be adopted across many countries. But in your own countries, there are much more defined, succinct questions that you need to have. So identifying those modeling use cases is really critical. And alongside them is who are these that are struggling with these policy questions. So as you start developing your models and your ideas about the policy with them, not in academic institutions and then sending results, but can we, re can we design questions together? Do you like this? Are there other options you can consider? And that becomes much more of a collaborative, iterative way of policy modeling. And there are many parts. I think for modeling, we think a lot about the outbreaks and epidemics, but within countries, we struggle with many more things. Like, how do you set targets? How long should it take us to, is it time for a photo? Yeah. A smile? <laughs> Good. How, how, how do you set up uh, the targets? Like, how, how many years should we focus on before we can get malaria eliminated or schistosomiasis? What type of investments are required in what form? What programmatic decisions and actions need to be? And how do you make sure that you don't leave portions of people or proportions of people not getting those investments, equity? 
So I mentioned that we had like the global win that Gavi has uh, supported, but it got delayed by COVID. And, and, and I wonder whether our scientists you also need to play some advocacy uh, pieces for the work that you do. Um, and, and we wrote one time, I think in 2022, uh, an article that we thought should poke Gavi a bit more about decisions they made before. It felt a, a little bit weird to write about it. I remember being approached to, to lead that work um, and, and I questioned, am I now doing an advocacy role or <laughs> what am I doing? But, but it was based on re-explaining the science and saying the urgency given the science you had and the results you got, why Gavi must not fail to get rabies vaccines back on. This is one effort, but there are also other efforts. And I think that eventually allowed rabies to get back on, on board. I think even more exciting is work that's been led by my colleague, Dr. Mutono Nyamai here. We, we focus a lot on out outbreak diseases. I think that's what attracts government quite a bit. But our, our countries struggle with endemic diseases that don't attract same attention. And one group of diseases is the neglected tropical diseases, which we have cap capacity and capability to get rid of and, and put dignity into our people. The way those diseases are, are treated or eliminated is by providing like mass drugs. You provide tablets of say praziquanta that can deal with the worms at a school level and you give all the kids every year. And, and, and as you do it, you bring the prevalence of the disease up to a point where it's eliminated. So here we take the example of an area in Western Kenya that has uh, Schistosomasis mansoni, one of the species of schisto. And just by doing your mapping of how prevalent uh, the parasite is, you can tell that Western Kenya is not homogeneous. There are parts of it that have high prevalence and others that have low prevalence. Yet, the way we deliver mass drug administration to the children is we go to each of these places as if they are homogeneous. We give them drugs every year for lots of years. But you could ask the question, how many treatment rounds are required to achieve whatever target you set as a nation or you set as, as globally? How many years does it take for us to bring the prevalence down to 1% or 10%, whatever target it is? How many treatment rounds are required for that? So the current treatment scenarios are you've got covering at least 75% of the population. Um, what if you try to get the coverage higher instead of 75? What if you had 80, 85, 90? Like consider this like policy options. What if you're only giving those drugs to children who are in school, which is the easier thing, go to a school, they're all having breakfast or having tea break, give them the, the tablets, or what if you paid more attention to reach also the community, that it is not just the five to 14 year olds, but also anybody who is in a certain area that might have it, the adults. And you could answer this question as to, would it work better as an annual treatment or treatment twice a year or treatment once every two years. The results I see from Mutono here indicate that for areas that have very high prevalence already, you're starting prevalence of more than 50%, some of those efforts of only dealing with children will not reach you there. And if you include uh, adults as well, you spend less years. So here is an example of uh, eight to 19 years if you are dealing with, uh, with what? With, with uh, community, five to five years and above. And here is if you are only dealing with uh, school age children. And that you sort of can achieve if you're doing it not annually, but if you do it twice a year for those high prevalence areas. So in a way, if you go back to your map here, you could say the treatment that you give, just blanket, is not sufficient to deal with this heterogeneity that you see in the population. 
And the result of those kind of models is to say, would the Kenyan government that deals with NTDs deliver the mass drug administration in this much more precise way? Areas that are red, give them annual treatment for anybody who is five years and above, at least achieve 75% coverage. And areas that are green here, you require 75% coverage but by annual treatment. And that gets taken up, and I think you have more precise model informed way of providing uh, interventions that end up reducing your disease. But if you think about outbreak situations where real-time policy development is needed, you are characterized by a mix of many, many, many unknowns and a strong demand for information to act upon. So you don't know yet this is when you're needed most. Um, and you have key epidemiological features not fully known or even the few local data that's available and even when it's available, it's rapidly changing and people are calling you all the time, what should we do? And I think that's like the story of COVID almost everywhere. So the second key thing then after you're having a nice modeling uh, groups and that are all really motivated is to be available <coughs> when those questions are being asked. I mean, we experience that a lot in Kenya. I'm sure maybe you also experience in other places that once COVID came in, because we didn't have famous groups of modelers like other countries did, then there was a lot of parachuting of people came in, coming in to support you for one or two weeks before they start charging. And I think this is possibly what you want to avoid by consistently investing in, in modeling capacity within our country so as they are available all the time to deal with, this, with, this, with these problems. And I think the big issues why government was struggling then was trust. Like I saw you have one of your, one of the, the areas to work on is data and data sharing. That, that, that's an issue of trust. And, and I think that has to be built over time. Um, context, because I think some of the accusations of the mod, uh, Ebola models for 2014, 2015, was that some of them completely lacked context or did not even imagine how the population would be responding to certain, to certain uh, uh, interventions, and, and they missed the mark. And I think there are quite a number of people that have looked at that uh, post-event. Post so from gut decisions and mental models, choices and decisions based on data, um, I think I need not belabor the point that we have a real world and then we develop a model world, and out of it we learn, we implement and learn, and start applying it back to a real world. And so I'll just give an example of our uh, initial struggles with COVID-19 in Kenya. We get the first case in um, 13th of March, and we have really scanty data, just a few, <laughs> a few cases that have come in, and, and, and government wanted to know what, what would happen um, in our country? When would you get the first 1,000 cases or the first 10,000 cases? So the really simple models that were done at the beginning gave the government some idea as to how quickly, in the absence of any intervention, you would get 1,000 cases or 10,000 cases. And I'm glad that our colleagues from the South African Center for Technological Modeling Analysis worked with WHO Afro to do that for many countries. And, and, and the result was almost the same for, for, for many of the African countries. I, I think this was really useful because a lot of uh, African uh, governments responded almost immediately from, from a projection of what would happen if they had inertia in action. And that, that, that in my view, possibly played a huge part in, um, in supporting uh, COVID-19 responses for the continent. But earlier on, I placed the slide that says the debate is possibly more on which is the right model or which are the right scientists to listen to. And, and you sort of, in emergency situations, you, you possibly don't want to be the only scientist that government listens to. <laughs> if you made errors because you are sleepy, <laughs> you could end up messing up a whole nation. So we overcame that by forming a, 
a very quick consortium of modelers that met many times, twice, at least twice a week, to go through our codes and to go through our modeling results and our assumptions. So as there was more of a consensus message that came out the modeling teams than an individual scientist would do. I think in other places, there are already established uh, response teams for models uh, that were using models, but a lot of our countries on the continent had to do it almost ad hoc. You formed committees quickly, and the way we responded is to bring together teams from Camry, from other universities, Strathmore, um, and the ministry to form the National Modeling uh, COVID-19 Modeling Committee that did not only listen to the priority policy options that government had, but converted those policy options into some model world, tested them, and then gave feedback to government as to here are uh, potential things that would happen given yeah. This process for me is really critical. This peer review, rapid peer review, exchange of ideas during a crisis is, is, is really critical. I would imagine even as a center that continues to grow and you have capacity that we do not want to close ourselves to be the only source of information that goes to government. I think it could be really dangerous. And, and science progresses by, by this kind of interactions and uh, questioning and, 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 and critical review. I would say having you know, been involved with you know, quote, quote unquote small decisions or big government decisions, uh, you almost need a playbook for how to work with technocrats, civil servants and, and politicians. And, and to say that, you know, once you pay your taxes, government is responsible for, <laughs> for health and well-being of the nation. They, they are the people who, who ought to do, to do that. They, they have got the money and the mandate. And I think, where do we play a part? I think as academics and uh, modelers, we, we can be lifesavers and we, and we are necessary, but you're not sufficient. It's not just us. How do you work with these governments that are responsible for health and well-being of the nation? It's really important. So an, an example is, at the time of COVID, I think one question that really precise, they had two dates. Should we open on June 2nd or should we open schools on August 31st? or do we delay reopening further? So how do you convert that question into some model, test it, and then give back information that government would, would think of? And so what we did was think about the different contacts that would be affected and what would happen you know, for different uh, scenarios. If you close schools or if you open school and had all masks and all, what would happen for that? And we gave this kind of different scenarios to government to respond to. And the response for government here at the time, the figure of the government was the president who has since retired. We have a new one now. And he, he made some comments as he was making the speech as to when to open schools and says, to answer these questions, I turned to a brain trust. Oh, finally, scientists to have some trust. And made uh, the finest doctors, <laughs> research scientists, and public practitioners for counsel. And I must admit, that opinion was divided on how we are to advance against this virus. And then, like one who knows mathematical modeling and scenario modeling, he goes on to say, in absence of scientific consensus among mental modelers, among experts in medical research and public sectors, I asked for scenarios. The president appearing to be very scientifically geared, eh? which is great. So I wanted to know the worst case scenario and the best options available for us to contain the spread of the disease without affecting the economy irreversibly. And I wanted these scenarios built around raw facts because we have decided to combat this pandemic in an open and transparent manner. The president has a nice speech right, right? <laughs> I take two points here. That one, I think we were fortunate to have a government that thought science could actually make a contribution. That's not universally true everywhere, as you can tell, even from far advanced economies. The second bit here is a place we failed terribly. He talks about um, disease without affecting the economy irreversibly. 
We never modeled for economy. We modeled for lives. It was just a public health lens that we were using. And we recognized that. And we had no capacity at the time to bring economists and listen to them and people from treasury. So even though we did a fantastic job in our view, thinking about human lives, we, we did not have the whole picture of the economy. And, and if another pandemic or, uh, epidemic was to happen, I hope that we'd be better prepared and can have more teams that think about this much more holistically. The result of which was, as we grew, we got you know, um, government now much more interested in forming relationships with academic institutions for posterity. And so here, our boss is signing memorandum of understanding uh, to say, let's, let's get more help from universities. Let them contribute to our societal decisions on the policies that you're making. But when you looked at uh, what was happening on the rest of the continent, um, we found, you know, at the time of uh, publishing this work, um, 22 countries did not have any COVID-19 publication, whether in already peer-reviewed or in med archive. And that just four countries at the time had contributed nearly half of all the publications, South Africa, Nigeria, Morocco, and Kenya. But even more importantly, that out of all the modeling work that had been done, only 12% of those publications were calibrated using local data. Meaning a lot of these, you know, even if they were published, they, they were not fit necessarily to, to, to local data, which, which I think is a big issue that you're trying to address as part of AMAX. But I think there are nice results, like a lot of the first order this <laughs> Positions on those papers were actually people from the continent, which means that maybe this is increasing. There is clearly lots of gaps in many places and lots more has to be done for our continent to be able to respond using these things like models in such a big disaster as we had in COVID. And I would imagine if you look at now other much more usual, quote unquote, endemic diseases, there might be less and less. And I think this is this is a slight to remind us that we are just at the beginning and there's lots more for us to do as a continent. And how to do it, I think there are fantastic uh, reports that have come from different places. I, I would refer you to one done by Shital Silal um, that, that recognizes countries are at different levels. Some countries have got modeling groups like here in Tunisia, others possibly don't have one single modeling group. There are others that are possibly already discussing how do we embed modelers within government ministries of health. Like, that's to us the much more developed ones. And we have to understand it's a continuum, and whichever stage each of us is at as a country, there are specific things that we could do that could help us move us through this continuum of improving use of modeling, making it, routinizing it, becoming like weather forecasts. And I think part of the foundational work like training in academic modeling is part of what uh, like AMAX is doing, providing these supportive collaborative networks. So I think you're ticking quite a number of these nice boxes that, you know, would move our continent towards much more routine use of data uh, insights that come from models. Just to, to say again, because I, I am increasingly uh, understanding this, that it's really difficult to scale up minus government in our own countries. I mean, I take the example of a few examples of Kenya where scaling up has happened. Some of it is from the private sector. Um, we have one, you said your bank is a main bank. So we have our own, <laughs> our own bank called Equity. Um, it started as a building circle in the 80s. It's the only bank early on in the 2000s and the 2010 that put so dust in the floors of the banking hall. And the reason they put so dust is they wanted even the farmer to feel comfortable walking into a bank. So this is not just nice terrazzo, nice marble uh, banking halls that 
they came down to the level of a farmer who would walk in gumboots to go and make banking by removing, by just putting sawdust. They were innovative. They went and stopped putting um, requirements that you must have minimum deposit, that all you need is your identification card, we give you a bank account. They made it possible for anyone to, o to own a banking, uh, a bank account without you know, those, those, those barriers. That's, that's one example. And, and, and they made banking really accessible for everyone in the country. The second one is something you call M-Pesa. M-Pesa is mobile money. Pesa in Swahili means money. So we have uh, um, one of our providers, Safaricom, which is like a Vodafone of, of Kenya. They came up with this idea of e-wallet, like your phone can be your bank. And we now make almost all our payments, whether it's water bills, electricity bill, or a purchase of sweets and bread using our phones. They, they, they moved from just having an actual bank into bank in your hand. And those kind of scaling up does require either a bite by the private sector and they can see opportunities and they do it, or if it's for matters of, of public health and importance, then governments have to play a big part. And, and there are few government major initiatives that I can say were scaled up. For instance, in the government that came into Kenya in the year 2003, primary school education was almost you opted to go to. It was not compulsory. So they made it free. And when they made free primary education, they also made it a law that you could not have your child in your home who is of school going age and not take them to school. So the result of it was fantastic. Like almost everyone went to school, even this old man here. And there's a nice Hollywood movie about him. He went to school, I think when he was about 85 years. Because finally, the barrier that kept him from knowing how to read and write had been removed by making free primary education. The other one that uh, happened in another government that came 10 years later was to have free maternity health services. Say now a mother should not struggle to give birth at home because of cost barriers, just go to hospital. You'll get help without pay. Those, those, those are policy questions. Some of them might not have been based on actual nice modeling, but it's, it's government that decided we can do this and they put you know, their, their, their monies where their mouth is. And I, and I do think that's how we ought to think as scientists, that if you wanted to move levers of society, then, then perhaps your science should actually be heard by people who make these bold moves. So one of the, the bold moves that uh, has happened much more recently for my country is the idea that for a long time we have made an investment in curative services. So government has been rating itself based on how many radiography machines you can get in a hospital or how many big you know, equipment. Because we want if you're sick, you get to hospital, you find help. But, but they have moved from the idea that the biggest investment should be in curative services to the biggest investment should be in preventative and promotion services. So they're now making a big move to try and uh, provide community health units and primary health care. And right there lies such an opportunity for the work of modelers and the work of scientists to influence, or at least to determine the best way to optimize those, 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 those results. I mean, those, those um, desires. So is the question, are African governments in the driver's seat when it comes to health financing, policy making? The biggest issue around how do you make health available to people is around how do you finance health? And so the move I have mentioned is what if there were lots of community health units and every person in the country had contact with at least some community health worker? And those identified when there are issues and they can push you forward to a network of primary health facilities. And from those primary health facilities, if you had bigger health issues, you can move on to primary health care 
uh, referral facilities. What kind of investments have they made? They have employed 100,000 community health uh, workers. Each of these is given 100 households, so that's about 10 million uh, households. We are a country of about 50 million people. Every household has approximately five people. So essentially, the, their estimate is that if you have 100,000 people that work in the community that have a kit, a kit of about $500 worth of equipment, they can get your blood pressure, they can give you some albendas or some, uh, some drug in case you have wounds or so. Um, what would be the impact of that? And the question that they have come to us about is not just what would be the impact of this, it's, it's a much more direct question. We have another three, four years before you go to elections. What should we tell our people that this investment made, what changes did they make in the community? So you can say we employed 100,000 people, but how did the epidemiological pattern of disease change given these investments? And so they, they, they have said, okay, let's, let's create a health, social health insurance fund, let's find out, uh, let's make mm -hmm. sure that primary health care is not paid for by the person, it's paid for by the state. If you have more than primary health care needs, then you are within a social health insurance fund. And if you know, you got a catastrophic uh, health expenditure that would come from a major disease like cancer, then let's put a funding that can support that. And then other bills. These are all policy things that require information from at least uh, epidemiological modeling. And if you look at even the actual regulations, they, they, they provide some insights. So here I'm taking regulations that have just been published not too long ago. They say, in terms of how to finance health, who pays, how much do they pay, and who is not able to pay that you should pay for them? Those are the questions they have in their mind. How do we arrive at who pays and how much they should pay? Not everybody is salaried. Like in Kenya, only a really small proportion of people are within a salary, meaning, meaning that at the end of the month, you can, you can take a bit of money from them directly from their employers and put it into health. How do you reach the informal sector and convince a person in the informal sector that you also need to make this amount of contribution. So one, one approach is can you use proxy means testing. If we knew the salaried people and what assets they have got and we have an estimate of how much they earn, can we transfer that to other uh, parts of the community? Big academic questions that government is hoping that can get answers from acad academicians that work on economics and others. But even more important, is how do you define a health benefit package for a nation? If you say you all have got insurance, what can that insurance buy me? To do that, you need sort of these health technology assessments, which are as academic as they come. Right? You have a combination of you want to know the assessment of interventions, appraisal of interventions, decision making on interventions, you have, you have a group that looks at that and they need the information about burden of disease, incidence of occurrence of disease, they need the population, equity, cost effectiveness, access to healthcare. Basically, it's all the things you have been taught in this summer school. Like they all need to be like within one umbrella to make that kind of decision. So as I end, I'll say, that's, that's a, during these peace times when you don't have a pandemic or big, big decisions that are taking our time, th this is something to focus on. This is something to understand, burden of disease and how you can make investments that eventually have big uh, impact at the population level. So you sort of started working on that. So we have information about, this is the map of Kenya. Every single dot here represents a GPS coordinate or the location of a health facility within the country. We have uh, just over 12,000 health facilities. 47 of those are government facilities, another 47 percent are private facilities, and then we have a few others that are faith-based and all. But it's not just 
where are the health facilities, what services are they able to provide? Because essentially what, what, what they would be interested in is if somebody was here and they needed maternity care, emergency maternity care, can they get it? Which health facilities should they go to? That's a modeling question. So some of the, 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 the work that we are, we are working on is like identifying, um, like, like doing the health accessibility. So to know given where you are within the service of Kenya, how long would it take you to access a health facility or even much more specifically, a health facility that provides what service? And so we use this kind of methods and some of our initial results are showing um, nearly 94% of the Kenyan population is within 30 minutes of a health facility, which sounds great. It's true for most parts, but for the northern parts of Kenya, it's not, it's not great. So there are areas that are doing pretty poor. But even more challenging is that it is not just access to a health facility, it's whether that health facility is ready to give you the service. So if I say, can I provide you outpatient services, then do I have the human resource? Do I have the infrastructure? Do I have the medicines? So when you look at readiness of a service, you see that proportion goes down to about 60%. Only 60% of the population are able to get uh, within 30 minutes of a health facility that is ready to offer the outpatient services. What, what does this mean? It means if government was to achieve universal health coverage through this process, then there are places that they need to put a bit more investment. And their question is, which are those places? Can data help? Can your modeling uh, support that kind of work? I think I've spoken for three hours, so I must end. What are the key points? I think I take you back to Banoeli about his aspirations, that there should be no decisions made without all the knowledge, analysis, and calculations can provide, whether it's on where to place a health facility or where to place a certain health service. And again, to say that a disease depends on factor X or factor Y without showing what, how much that factor will be influenced, uh, would have the influence of the whole result, is not to say much. So the, the demand for us as, as, as people interested in policy modeling is much higher. It's not just it's associated to it, but here are the levers that you can move to make the change you're desiring. And I think when you carefully reasoning, is, careful reasoning is applied to problems at issue, which is relevancy, uh, modeling can be incredibly useful for informing policy decisions and programmatic actions. I would also add that it's, it's important to define use cases for your models. Like we had defined those for COVID, we are defining them now for the biggest health challenge that the country is facing, which is how do we improve universal health coverage and the impact of that. Strengthening local modeling expertise, which also involves collaborating with others like what Hamax is doing, and to actually believe that government are responsible so it's like learn the, play, the playbook of how to work with your government or to work with your technocrats so that at least the work is relevant and useful uh, for the country. And importantly, I think small projects are great, but programs at scale are really important. But there's a pathway to it. Sort of develop your skills, and as you move on, you get more responsibilities and on and on. And, and, and I don't know whether you're supposed to recommend books that are non-academic, but here are three books that I think would make for a good read, which I've enjoyed quite, quite much, range. Um, that it is not just specialization that is great, you sort of need to have ability to think about and to draw from other, many other, uh, many other uh, disciplines. If, if you're interested in science policy, uh, then this is a nice book to read, Science Policy and the Value-Free Ideal, which I quoted quite a bit at the beginning. And then I'm not proposing that we are a business, but I think there are great ideas about hedge of concept here, about you know, good to great, that we should be not just good modelers, we should be great uh, citizens that, that influence uh, our nations towards the positive side. 
And I'm very grateful to not just the funders, but the excellent team that we work with at SEMA. And possibly I should take a few questions. Thank you. My question is, uh, models are uh, supposed uh, to uh, provide uh, accurate prediction to be useful for policy makers. And uh, to provide uh, accurate prediction, models need uh, good inputs. I, by inputs, I mean uh, data. Uh, in the African context, data are uh, most of the time missing. And uh, when available, they are uh, not uh, with good quality. I mean, with uh, many uh, bias, uh, selection bias, and it's not representative of the target population. So how we can handle this situation with uh, how we can uh, generate uh, good output when we don't have uh, good inputs? Uh, that's my question. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I would say that perhaps it's true we want to provide the best predictions to, to policy questions, but I increasingly feel we ought to provide that also with areas of, of uncertainty. So as it's clear, here is what we, we think our models are telling us, and here are the biggest weaknesses, or here are the areas that need improvement. And, and I think in communicating that, you sort of start identifying data gaps, and then models stop, or modelers stop being just, we think your data is not great, we would do better if we had be better data to, we can actually work together, because this is the kind of quality of data that you require. And in fact, when we talk like to our own Ministry of Health, they always hit us back and say, you tell us your data, our data is not great, but help us get the right data. How do you do that? I think it's like when they're developing their questionnaires to do, for instance, the healthcare uh, facility assessment that modelers don't get involved at the analysis level, but they get involved at the data collection level to de help design. So I, I, I don't think it's, it's an immediate thing that you can address data quality. I think it's a continuum, sort of, it's a cumulative thing that you have to do. So if you establish yourself as modelers within then work with your governments to keep improving your data sets and, and providing feedback so as your data sets are as useful for models as is possible. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask a question. Thanks for the great presentation, Tampi. Really inspiring. Um, but my question he here is, Yes, mathematical modeling can be useful, but what is the limitation of mathematical modeling for help in taking decision? And knowing that uh, mathematical models are different, um, how, what kind of model and what type mo of model can really help in, in, um, in health, taking decision in health system? Okay. Um, maybe I start with the latter question. I, mean, I, I, I think if you if you did your PhD in mathematical modeling, you might feel um, dynamic modeling like like government should just listen to dynamic modeling. Uh, my, my, <laughs> my interpretation of at least interaction is that they really care less about what you call the model. W what they have is real question like where do we place a health facility? and how can we maximize the number of people that can access it. Now, if the method to do that is your mathematical model well and good, if it's your, your statistical model well and good, 
they, are, they, have, they have a desire for an answer, and I think it's within our academic circles to define what is the ap appropriate model to use for that. Now, in the context of, say, uh, even an epidemic, you could use you know, a statistical model to make very short predictions, or you could use a dynamic model to make predictions of what would happen if we had different interventions. So I feel like th the conversation about the type of models is, is more a conversation within academics, whereas within policy, it's more what's the question, how are you able to best answer it. Limitations. Um, I think one major limitation I, uh, I've seen is just the limitation of communication. Like how do you come from your complex R-coded models to what does it mean for the policymaker? Like how do you simplify it so as they are clear on the assumptions you have made, they are clear on the areas of uh, uncertainty that you have got, and they are clear on what was your approach to the, to the different interventions or different policy options that they had. Um, if I was to answer that question, I would say, like, how do you address it? It feels to me like it's also like the same way. I, there has to be a continuum. It has to sort of, it's some piece of work you have to work together with, 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 with policymakers for them to understand your language a bit more, and importantly for us to also understand their language and how the decisions are made. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Tumbi, for the nice presentation. Very clear. So I have a question on the modeling and another one on, on rabies. So, <coughs> you know, for people who are not in the modeling field, Sometimes they are afraid uh, of uh, modeling recommendation. I, also, I already experiment that discussing by some people in the institute who are experimental people and who believe on the experience they are doing and what they can see. And I think in some time they are right because sometimes the model give you something and the reality is completely different. And I think it is, uh, <coughs> you, you can see it a lot. So you presented the Granish uh, paper on 2009 as an example, the work she, they done on HIV, predicting what will happen, it was in 2009, during this year, is how, were they right? <laughs> if you will look at the curve, I don't know, what HIV, this is the, the, the question just to see if uh, it was, uh, 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 like a good uh, uh, prediction tool. Another question on rabies, <coughs> I, s I, I understood you said the domestic dogs uh, are most, like bo uh, rabies cases are mostly from domestic dogs. I was uh, thinking that it is the opposite in the street dog, it's uh, strange. How can you explain that is, is the risk the risk of rabies after a bite is higher in street dog or in rabies or is just the frequency of bite is higher in domestic uh, in houses so I, I need just to have clarification and also I understood that there is a test a rapid test I, 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 didn't, I understood that there is no test for rabies after uh, ex an exposition uh, if there is a, a test would you recommend the person to not take the prophylaxis, the post-exposition prophylaxis, even if the test is negative? If there is a test, I understood that there is a test, but for someone who was exposed, uh, if he do the test and is negative, would you recommend him to not take the prophylaxis? Okay, very good questions. Um, and, and I agree. Um, maybe people that do experiments, mm -hmm. everything is so well defined that once they add one ingredient, they can tell what's gonna happen. Um, but I, I think modeling, we use modeling to sort of understand uh, phenomena sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but, but the demand sometimes for modeling is to also out of sample, you know, say what might happen. And, and that's, that's, that's a, a a, a bit of a, 
of a, of a strain. And I think um, my take is like you need to do it, but also provide areas of uncertainty. Like that's really important to even building trust towards models. Um, and I don't know whether it's fair to judge a model as directly as was published in 2009 and say, well, are they right <laughs> or they not? Because essentially they, they, they have been constrained to certain parameters, say maybe achieving ARV uptake of 80% and then different parts of the world achieve differently, you know? Um, so we, we sort of provide the model projections within con con constrained parameters but the real world works in slightly different ways and you have to sort of keep updating that as, as you get more. So I don't know whether one model 2009 is sufficient to say this is, I think you sort of need to keep updating them along the way. But if you're making a big decision as to should we make ARVs um, available, that's a big intervention. Um, then you need a bit more clarity like you can get from a model of very defined uh, uh, policy scenarios. In this case, they have a defined policy scenario. We do nothing or we give people after CD4 count goes to 350 or if we make sure that everybody who gets tested uh, and is positive gets it. And then you also make assumptions like uh, what, what's, what's your likelihood of catching everybody who, has, who, has, who, is, who is infected? Uh, like voluntary testing, it's not everyone who's gonna show up. So those, those assumptions might cause differences into whether or not. But I think by and large, um, the incidence of HIV has largely been, 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 been reduced by the use of antiretrovirals at, at, a, at a voluntary testing and, and, and what on the part. On the question of rabies, um, human testing, um, once you have clinical science, it's almost like sure death. Um, the, 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 and a lot of the confirmation for rabies is at post-mortem, which is unfortunate. So you get a brain sample and you sort of do the test. But there have been good attempts to use saliva of, of patients um, or, or to get behind here, the, get some of the hairs next to the brain stem. Um, and a bit of that has been used to do like PCRs and show whether you've got the virus. I think at the, at the time of uh, confirming that you have got the virus, there's it's, it's just a it, it's a case to report and to tell you what's a public health burden. There's absolutely nothing you can do at that point in terms of saving the patient. Regarding whether you can make a clinical decision as to whether you should get post-exposure prophylaxis or not based on your RDT or your test, I think it sort of depends not just on the on the individual but also on the epidemiological pattern of the disease in the area. So for instance, given how serious rabies is, if my son right now got beaten by a dog that I proved was not um, rabid, sure as heaven, I would still get them their job. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not making chances with rabies, right? It's not, it's not common cold, right? Um, and, 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 and I think the decisions about judicious use of post-exposure prophylaxis change as the epidemiological pattern of the disease becomes, uh, keeps changing. So I, I bet like if in the US and you get bitten by a dog, PEP is unlikely to be the thing that they, they have to insist you get because there is there's really little uh, rabies around. Um, <laughs> the fact that now you raised it, there's some nice work done by economists looking at um, whether even improving post-exposure prophylaxis access um, reduces the number of people that uh, get the job and they were using South American data. And I think as long as the disease is, is around, people can still see it, PEP use just keeps going high. Until that one time you have almost gotten, gotten rid of it within, within, within the animal sector. But yeah, very good question, thank you. To show that we find exactly the, the good value that corresponds to the reality, because mathematical modeling is more about understanding as Tambi said. So it will help taking decision because it will make you understand the phenomena more, more than really having the real value. So uh, maybe we will try to calibrate at the beginning and we will find the result because anyway, we will make the model fit exactly the, the, the data, but it's more for understanding. Would like to ask another question? 
Remark? Thank you, our dear presenter, for the wonderful presentation. This may probably not be directed to you alone, but some of the people around. I'm aware of the work by Ronald Rossi about malaria and uh, his recommendations on mosquitoes. And it has brought me thinking, because I've been here for about two weeks, I've not seen a, a single mosquito, and uh, I've been told there's no malaria in Tunisia. Yet in other African countries, it's a killer, one of the, of the most dangerous killers of our population. How is it that some policies can work in some countries and completely fail in others? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I'm assuming you, you are saying there's a policy about dealing with the mosquitoes here that worked or? I don't know what, what yeah, you're... Right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, 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 go ahead. On wh why some, I mean, I, I'm taking this as a general question now, why some policies work in certain places and others they don't? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question, but, but, but sometimes I think it's, if you take the example of COVID, um, I, I just think there are places where maybe human or circumstances uh, favor some policies and others don't. So if you say, for instance, you can close people in and uh, insist on um, on minimizing movement. Um, it works in some places. Other places, people are, don't like being told to stop doing things. You get what I mean? Um, and, and if the models will say the policy was assuming compliance to a certain recommended intervention, and then due to human factors, the compliance of of, of, of the intervention in one area differs from another from sociological, cultural uh, reasons, then I would, see, I would think you'd see differences in, in the impact of that policy uh, across, across, across geographies and across spaces. Would you like to ask another question? Oh, I mean, the question was not just to me, said, and to other people in the room, so anyone can also <laughs> give their, <laughs> their comments. Small remark concerning Mackendix. He was uh, head of Pasteur Institute of uh, Punjab during the 1920s. Right. Just a small remark concerning to make the link with Pasteur Institute here. Yeah. And uh, well, I have a question for you. In fact, how do you deal? How do you deal the, the certainty that uh, generally the mathematician have when he's running a model? You have a certainty what you do know what will happen in the future. And uh, with a politician, politician who would like to have answer what will happen in the future. And uh, sometimes explaining that uh, we don't know. We, this is what project the models. But in reality, we don't know what is the reality. And uh, perhaps sometimes there is a misunderstanding about uh, the fact that we don't know. The meaning of we don't know. <laughs> That's, that's a good question. I, I think like uh, in the context of COVID, it's, it's maybe one disease even politicians didn't know. So they, <laughs> they didn't have like preformed, at least the politicians that, that we worked with and the technocrats that we worked with, they, they didn't come in onto the table with preconceived ideas and knowledge. So if you tell them, this is what we know and this is what we don't know, they, they still felt edu educated. And, and there wasn't 
I feel like we're quite fortunate in that context that it was new, everyone is struggling, and information, whatever little information, even where we have unknowns, was better than what they had. I think it's, it's supposed to be much more difficult if, if you go into an area where um, you were not fully certain of like certain parameters and people already have preformed ideas about what would work or not. So f the, the example is like the issue of primary health care. You know? There are lots of people with mental models as to, and, and based on experiences that could have their own arguments on what is the appropriate intervention. And so when you provide your modeled world, they, they, they feel like your modeled world could also be equal to their, 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 all the models they have calculated in their heads. And another point, I think, um, the thing is to be really honest with this is what we know, this is what we don't know. If we got this information, it would be better um, and, and have a human conversation around that. Because I, I mean, I think our work is about uncertainty, not so much about certainty in predictions. Thank you very much. Yeah? You had, and I completely agree with, uh, with what you just said, uh, Professor Thumbi. But I think the main, the main, um, um, I think idea that can maybe um, facilitate this interaction between policymakers and, and modelers is our responsibility to make them understand what is a model, uh, and that is a, a simplification of the real life. We cannot consider all the complexity of human being or f of, of um, like uh, complex uh, systems. So we need to be really very precise on what we call a hypothesis, what do we integrate into the model, and what can be our expectation. Sometimes we want to like please them and tell them we can do everything, but we don't. So I think when we be, uh, we are very honest on our um, tools limitation, um, and then make this uh, effort to uh, present things as they are. Um, I think this comes very naturally to understand what we do uh, um, mean by uncertainty, and what we do mean by trends, and how precise and good can be our models. Um, and, uh, and one more thing is to emphasize that they take the decisions and they take the, the responsibility. The responsibility is not ours. We have the rigor and the formulation, mathematical formulation of the problem, but they do have the knowledge on all what we don't include in, in our models. Thank you. So uh, to follow up on uh, what uh, Mr. Minimilet said and Mrs. Dora, like we see that uh, policymakers already struggle to uh, accept like mathematical modeling and its outputs. But now there is another type of models, which are AI models, okay, which introduces this concept of black boxes. So do you think this will make policymakers even more skeptical? And if so, how much are we losing? compared to other uh, countries around the world? That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, about the black box, <laughs> I, I think m maybe one, and this is th me thinking on, on, on my feet, it's, it's, if it's gonna be ubiquitous, people use AI to answer many of their questions of life, then they possibly will not doubt as much. I mean, like, who doubts what Google tells you? So it may be that AI is not gonna face the same kind of difficulty as your, because it's been used almost by everyone. Uh, as opposed to math models, when they appear and you all start with a big, um, big equations, it's, 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 uh, it, it can be quite, quite, quite heavy for policymakers. I mean, I, maybe our role is to highlight that the products of what you see from AI is also a product of things happening 
that they depend on what input of data and uh, what, what train the models that maybe our role now will, will change to, to bring reality into, <laughs> into, into why you shouldn't believe everything that uh, you know, Copilot tells you. Um, but it's, it's an area that I, I think as modelers we ought to, to not be left behind, like to ignore, we can't bury our heads in the sand uh, and we must actively be involved in finding out whether our a AI is going to help our modeling and, uh, and to how do we best start to understand the black boxes or even interpret them or what are the limits of, of, of what you get out of it. So I, I don't have a full answer, but those are my quick thoughts on my feet. Thank you very much.